Good afternoon. First of all, I want to thank Go Wang, Notre Dame class of 2008 and owner of ESQ Clothing for hosting us today. For those who are listening to or watching this from home, Irish Illustrated is proud to present this podcast from ESQ's incredible showroom here on the corner of North LaSalle and Lake Street in downtown Chicago. You've seen ESQ's exceptional suits and shirts on Irish coaches and players. And to be here in the shop to meet with Guh and his incredible team, it's no wonder why the Irish look the way they do off the field. From their bamboo cooling shirts to fully bespoke suit solutions, ESQ is on a level with few peers. I also want to thank Mike Fletcher, right over there, Notre Dame class of 2010, and Notre Dame Club of Chicago president for putting on this event. The Notre Dame Club of Chicago is the largest Notre Dame alumni club, and the work that they're doing to spread the mission of the university is something we should all be proud of. Now, for the reason you all came or are tuned in from home, I'd like to introduce part of our Irish Illustrated team that's here today. Starting stage left in his fifth year covering college football, in his first season with us at Irish Illustrated, we have Drew Mentock. Uh, Drew Mentock is an exceptional reporter, a South Bend native, and continues to inspire us with his hard work, attention to detail, and quality journalism. We are thrilled to have Drew as a big part of our team. Stage right in his 25th season covering college football, we have John Bryce. John is a national football writer for Football Scoop and a truly invaluable member of the Irish Illustrated team. John cut his teeth mainly with the SEC, and there's nobody in the media. Again, there is nobody in the media that has as many connections, is truly as well-connected, not just at Notre Dame, but on a national level as a guy we affectionately refer to as JB. A true professional with a work ethic that raises the standard of everyone around him. Having John on our team has improved the content and increased the content that Irish Illustrated can provide to our readers and listeners immensely. We are beyond proud to have John as a member of our Irish Illustrated team. It's just been an, an exceptional experience to have him here. And last but not least, right in the middle here, the reason many of you came. I feel like the announcer for the Chicago Bulls, all those years that Michael Jordan was being introduced at the old Chicago Stadium and then at the United Center. Uh, born and raised in South Bend, Indiana, a Marion High School grad, a 1982 Notre Dame grad, and former Notre Dame baseball monogram winner. In his 43rd season covering Notre Dame football, the guy who created the genre and the reason we all have jobs, the institution that is Tim Priester. It's pretty simple, really. Tim created this, and nobody does it better. I'm going to let my team here make some opening statements and talk a little bit, but I want to thank everyone again for coming. Please ask questions. We want this to be uh, back and forth as much as possible. The more you ask, the more information that we'll give. We hope to do this again in the future. With uh, that being said, with the introductions being done, Tim, how about you start with a little Miami of Ohio intro for this weekend? A big game, yeah? Huge game. And, and uh, you know, Marcus had, had pointed to that. They did a great job in the preseason preparing for Texas A&M and went out there and took it to them. Didn't blow them out, certainly, but they were the better team and the, the team that deserved to win, Riley Leonard helped lead them to victory, and the defense was the Notre Dame defense that we've become accustomed to. But dealing with success has uh, obviously been a, a, a difficult situation for Marcus. Now, his first game as the full-time head coach uh, was Ohio State, a tough game to win on the road, his alma mater, and they didn't, they didn't react to failure, I guess you could say, the following week against Marshall. But you know, they played well against BYU and North Carolina and then laid an egg against Stanford and so on and so on. So we've seen this pattern. That's what happens with young coaches. Everybody knows that 
Uh, it, it's really difficult to ha to be a guy that becomes the head coach at the University of Notre Dame without any head coaching experience. But I think we all felt pretty good about the selection. Certainly the team felt good about it. You can't always let the team decide what you should do with your your coaching decisions. But it, it, it made sense at the time. I think Luke Fickle would have been a guy that Notre Dame was interested in. But Cincinnati made the playoffs that year, and, and Notre Dame didn't feel like they could wait. So... Marcus Freeman is the guy. I don't want to, you know, I, so many of our readers, are they relitigate everything. See, you shouldn't have hired a guy that, look, it is what it is. Marcus Freeman is the head coach in Notre Dame, and I think he has a chance to still be a really good head coach, but he's still learning some things along the way here. So, um, you know, really disappointing to be 2-1. and one. Everybody wants us to predict what's going to come, uh, you know, in the in the remaining nine regular season games. Will they make the playoffs? With the loss to Northern Illinois, it probably it looks like they're going to have to win the rest of them. It sure would help if Northern Illinois went undefeated the rest of the year. That would make Notre Dame look a little bit better. But, you know, again, we're always asked to predict what's going to happen, and we're trying to report on the game that's that uh, that's being played. And we're at that venue covering it, and we didn't criticize them enough apparently after a 67 or a 66 to seven victory over Purdue, when everybody played well, including Riley Leonard. He didn't make every pass, but he played really well, and the whole team played really well. So that's where we are now. Miami of Ohio comes into town, a 28 point underdog, just like Northern Illinois was. A little quick synopsis on them, and I'll let our other guys, uh, our guys here, talk. But. Um, they don't run the football well at all. They're not running. They're under. They're like 1.7 yards per carry. Chuck Martin's been there 11 years. Good coach. Great dude. Love him. I don't know if any of you guys know Chuck Martin, but just a, just a real hoot. I've gone down and visited him a couple times in the summer at, in Oxford at Miami of Ohio just to, uh, just to visit with him because he's fun to be with. But they're up against it. We said the same thing about Northern Illinois. Northern Illinois is the most experienced team on Notre Dame's schedule this year. Uh, Miami of Ohio start, have started out slowly. They've only scored, what, six, 22 points. They're second to last in scoring in the country. Uh, but I know Chuck Martin will have them ready to roll. So um, thank you for being here. I appreciate the, the offer to, to come here. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, the guy we call JB. Thanks, TP. Uh, really pleased to be here. As a handful of you know, my wife actually works for the university. She works in development. She's a South Bend native, um, so it's been fun seeing her back in her hometown for the past six, almost seven years. And then um, she didn't work for Notre Dame when she moved back. She's a CPA by trade, and um, she worked for a firm headquartered in Nashville and actually got recruited to Notre Dame while we were already living in South Bend. She is remarkably passionate about the university, about the mission. Um, she believes in it a ton. We cut vacation short this summer in July so that she could go to the Jersey Shore and help Notre Dame host an event there. So not that I'm bitter, but um, no. <laughs> She's, she's a superstar. I ride her coattails, um, but her passion for the university is infectious. I'll tell you a couple of quick things. Um, I went up to one of the Notre Dame communication people recently, and my background primarily is the SEC, specifically the University of Tennessee. I was also a sideline reporter for radio for a couple of years. This face is not meant for sideline TV, um, but it's the best thing I've ever done. Uh, but I told uh, Notre Dame comms head just within the last two weeks, I said, man, sometimes you all take for granted what it's like to come interview these kids. I was in the SEC a really long time. It's really awesome to come interview these Notre Dame kids. And I'm over there more than I have to be um, because my football scoop role uh, has a broader scope, but we live beside campus. We love, um, you know, my wife loves the university. I have a lot of respect for the people in the program. Quickly on Marcus, um, the, the thing that I've heard, and I was asked this on one of our recent podcasts, I talked to some coaches in the ACC and the SEC recently about it, and they were just like, Bryce, it's really bleeping hard to learn on the job at Notre Dame. And there might not be a bigger microscope in college football than what there is on Notre Dame. And it's especially that way when you follow a guy like Brian Kelly that rebuilt Notre Dame from the, the tatters it was in when he was there. So um, what I will tell you is that Marcus has unequivocally raised the floor of the Notre Dame roster. And I've talked about it extensively with these guys. They're so much closer. They're not there, but they're so much closer to be in an SEC position group at linebacker. They are an SEC position group in the secondary right now. They're going to be an SEC group 
when they get more experienced on the offensive line. They're elite at running back. They're not there yet at, at um, wide receiver, not an SEC group or an Ohio State group or Oregon. They're better. Um, and they're not there yet at, on the defensive line. They've got some good ones. Um, and Bubaka, Bubakar Traore may prove to be that type of guy. I fu fully believe Bryce Young will be that type of guy. But Marcus has raised the floor significantly, or they wouldn't have won at Texas A&M because I mentioned this before. I was on the field extensively pregame at Texas A&M, and I was with some NFL scouts. And um, Notre Dame was on the right end of the field, and Texas A&M was on the left end of the field. And the scouts spent an inordinately larger amount of time on this end of the field. You, If you just looked at the two programs, you would not have known Texas A&M was year one and, and Notre Dame was year three. They're, they just look different. And you see it when you're, when you're on the field. I'm reminded of it a few years ago when I saw Derrick Henry and um, some of those guys on the field at Alabama. And like this guy could have played any position. And then when you put him in pads, he looked like freaking RoboCop. Um, so Marcus, I, I've said this, he gained so much home equity with that win at, at Texas A&M. And then, you know, he almost defaulted his loan the next week. So, um, but there's still a, a great runway for this team. I think very strongly that Notre Dame has to win all of its games until USC to still be in that playoff contention. Then it depends on what USC is at that point in time if Notre Dame can win that game. If Notre Dame's 11-1, and one, I think Notre Dame hosts, but probably as the 7 or 8 seed instead of the 5 seed. And the 5 seed was on the table if they hadn't stubbed their toe. But I still think they can be a team that hosts a playoff game. Um, you need Northern Illinois to go beat North Carolina State this weekend. Um, the last thing you want is for Northern Illinois to get run out of the building this weekend. You need Texas A&M to keep getting quality wins. And I know Billy Napier, he will be fired this year, barring a miracle. But that's still good to go on the SEC and win in the dominant fashion that they did. And they've got more, they've got more wins on their schedule. They just got more losses too. Um, but but there's a lot of runway out there for Notre Dame. They're very encouraged by how they're recruiting right now. I spoke recently with a number of people in in that department. And they're they're encouraged by things. They did not see any sort of panic after the NIU loss. They just moved on from it. They were back out on the recruiting trail. Some of the guys last week getting after it, um, and that's the lifeline of the program. Also important to note, um, they're being far more proactive in NIL. I mentioned this maybe on the podcast Monday a week ago. They're launching a second collective. That's significant news. That's um, I can't give all the details right now, but um, they are launching a second collective that is going to help tremendously with current and future players. Before I hand it over to Drew, I just want to say, I mean, Dan introduced us all and said how long we've been in the business, but this is John's second year with us, and this is Drew's first year with us. And, uh, I mean, if you've heard our, our podcast, and Drew, you know, we'll, we'll start placing him uh, in our podcast more. We have Tim O'Malley, who uh, couldn't make it here tonight. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm just so proud of our group, man. We've just I – mean, when I when I look at – you know, our formidable competition, I just look at our people and I mean, JB is connected and and has so much insight has added so much to our to our podcast. And Drew is Drew is a dream come true. He is the ultimate worker B. I, we can count on him to handle anything whenever it breaks. And that is absolutely huge. The older I get. <laughs> When something's happening at 11 o'clock at night in my 43rd year and my 60, uh, 64th year of life, it's nice to have some younger guys around that can tend to those things. And so really proud of our group, really proud of what Ju Drew has brought to us. We just hired him uh, earlier uh, this year, the beginning of the year, and uh, couldn't be prouder of our group. Drew? Yeah, so I don't, um, I didn't go to Notre Dame, but my wife is a third generation uh, Notre Dame graduate. I also grew up in South Bend. Didn't grow up a Notre Dame fan, but we grew up around and as I got older, grew to appreciate the tradition and kind of what it did for the town and, and really uh, the impact it has locally and, you know, really across the world. Um, kind of wanted to pick up with what John was talking about. I think college football can be so reactionary. We have a game and then you have a week and you're talking about that game the whole time. And obviously we're, Every you know, days, promoting man. that, Every you know, days. so much, but we, so much so with what happened, you know, against Northern Illinois and stuff, I think you look at it. We don't know. Northern Illinois could win 11 games. They could win the MAC. It's really hard to um, – it's so easy in the moment, I guess, to, to really harp on those wins or those losses. But we didn't know Marshall was still a bad loss, but they still won nine games that year, even after having a letdown loss the weekend right after beating Notre Dame. So I think 
sometimes I think those perspectives are worth keeping up. And, and I think Purdue, I think there's a lot of positives to take, even if Riley Leonard still didn't make a lot of downfield passes. I think on the season I wrote down, he's 34% um, on passes over 10 yards. It traveled over 10 yards in there. Obviously, you want to see him much better than that, and they need to show improvements on that soon. But on the bright side, they still score 66 points, and you see the impact he has in the running game when they're running plays that he's comfortable with. They He sat down with Mike Dembrock last week and was like, these are the plays where if you call it, I'm just going to run. I don't feel comfortable throwing this. And they clearly are drilling down on what he feels good doing well, and, and we saw the impact last week. So, Yeah, I you know, and I, I want everybody to ask questions, but I just want to – you know, Riley Leonard <clears throat> led them to victory against Texas A&M. He played very poorly against Northern Illinois, along with about three dozen other Notre Dame football players. He played injured in the second half, which I think uh, I think we've all kind of weighed in that maybe a more veteran head coach goes to Steve Angeli in the second half against Northern Illinois and trusts him a little bit. Because all they have to do is generate a little bit more offense than they did, which was, what, one touchdown in the first drive of the second half. Um, but, you know, you, uh, Brian Kelly, I think, would have made that move. Um, but but Marcus Freeman didn't. And um, and we don't know whether Angeli would have bailed them out or not. But uh, And then, they, you know, they responded to adversity, which they've been able to do pretty much for Marcus Freeman. So we'll see where we go from there. But uh, – we are ready, willing, and able to answer any question about any aspect of Notre Dame football on and off the field. And if we don't know it, we'll make something up along. <laughs> no, we'll tell you the truth. That's one thing I do want to say that, you know, I think that we differentiate ourselves from the rest of the Notre Dame media in that, I mean, clearly, I was born and raised in there. I saw my first game when I was six and 66, I saw OJ Simpson score two touchdowns against Notre Dame and Notre Dame stadium in 67, um, all the USC games, et cetera, et cetera. And so I love Notre Dame. I want Notre Dame to win, but we have a responsibility as journalists first and foremost to tell the truth as we see it. And that's what we do. And that's why I'm really proud of what we do, but happy to answer any questions that you have. Yeah, please fire away. Well, interesting that you guys are talking about how Marcus is doing, but I think when Kelly started, I mean, he lost the Tulsa. Was South Florida on his watch? South Florida, and, yeah. And then he has the 2016 season, and he's able to bounce. So I'm hoping the university gives Marcus that chance to just kind of find himself. Yeah. Because I, I see a lot of positives. And what are your thoughts of contrasting that? Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, the the, diff, the biggest difference that you hear is that Brian Kelly inherited a crater and um, Marcus Freeman inherited a program that had won like 50 games in the previous five years. And so um, there is a, a great difference there. And I'll say this, I think, um, I think Brian Kelly is an elite CEO, um, but I think Marcus Freeman – um, has a better holistic approach, especially at Notre Dame. I think the authenticity there is something that really resonates. And I plan to, um, and this is not the hardest question in the world, but Marcus just got named the AFCA good coach, good, good teams works coach of the year. It's an honorary thing, but only one coach is named that, and Marcus earned that honor this week. That's the type of person you want representing your university. That's the type of person you want leading your young men. Um, I, I watched Marcus Freeman yesterday leave the practice field, and I'm, I'm failing because I don't know off the top of my head who number 85 is for Notre Dame's offense. It's obviously a tight end. Check one. Thank you. You want the mic? Um, <laughs> he, he walked out arm around Jack Larson. They each had a cup of Gatorade and they just talked the entire way across the street around the war zone where they're building the new Shields family hall. Um, you see that stuff and it matters. You see him shaking hands with the guy and it matters. That's one thing I will say. He could have made a quarterback change in the second half against Northern Illinois because his authenticity, I, I believe he could get those players back. And he wasn't wanting to to replace Riley because he was um, mad at him or anything like that. He was he was hurt and he was ineffective and he couldn't be Riley because they didn't call any runs for him in the second half. Marcus has the ability to coach those guys harder than Brian Kelly, in my very strong opinion, because the authenticity of the relationships there. So that's one of the things that sticks out to me. You ask 
will they give them time? They're going to give him time. Um, but it's year three, and he, he signed a six-year deal. Um, it's Notre Dame benefits a little bit because it's not a public school, so not as much is made. Like, if you're an SEC coach and you're in year three of a six-year deal, it's being used against you in recruiting for every single person anywhere. That's not used as much against Notre Dame, but, but Notre Dame, Marcus Freeman needs to, to close this season exceptionally strong and get a new contract. Yeah, definitely. I think when, kind of like you, when he started, I kind of compared him to like a five-star recruit. But as we think five-star recruits aren't necessarily guys who come in and play right away. Sometimes they're a dude who just, or somebody who just has all the tools and they got to get to that point. They still got to develop that. And, and unlike, I guess, a, a five-star prospect, he's in charge of developing himself to a large degree. But I think I'll be curious, like John said, how he finishes out this year. I will say the difference between after they lost to Marshall and then beat uh, Cal the next week, you could tell he was almost just like relieved. After they beat Purdue last week, even in the manner they did, you could tell he was just like, I don't know, I don't know if locked in was right the word, but he was not happy. He was not like letting go. I almost, yeah, he almost seemed like somber, like we're, this isn't a big deal. And I think that maybe is a sign of progression of where he's going mentally is like, I know what it takes and like, I'm just going to keep my head down and, and maybe kind of just really hit the ground hard here and, and he told his guys hey enjoy this win it's hard to win we need to go enjoy this win but I don't know how much Marcus enjoyed it because there's an expectation of winning there so you expect to win so you exhale far more than you celebrate a win and then you anguish over a loss and, and that's tough but that's what makes it Notre Dame I, I, I speculated about this in my in my column after the game that um I coached high school baseball, my alma mater, for nine years, and I and I could relate to the way I thought that Marcus Freeman was reacting because it was like, "Hey, we played great. Damn, did we blow it in the last game?" You know, I mean, I thought that 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 that, that was the way I read him, and I I've personally have felt that way before as well. But you know, and I know a lot of people are mad at Brian Kelly and they hate Brian Kelly and they want bad things to happen to Brian <laughs> Kelly. We get a, we get a lot of flavor of that certainly, but thank goodness he handed Marcus Freeman. A, it was a, actually a 54 win program in five years. And he wasn't, you know, he wasn't perfect. He didn't win. He didn't win nearly enough big games. Brian Kelly probably would have lost to Texas A&M and beat Northern, beat Northern Illinois. People say to us all the time, well, all Brian Kelly could do was was win the games he should win. That's how you go undefeated in a regular season. He coached at Notre Dame for 12 years. He went undefeated during the regular season three times. Parsegian didn't do that. Holtz didn't do that. Holtz's schedule was a lot. It was really, really, really tough. But so, you know, I mean, it was good that, that Marcus Freeman inherited that. Um, you know, so he was, he was in a better position to hit the ground running than most Notre Dame coaches. Um, you know, Air Parsegan in, in, inherited something bad. Dan Devine inherited something good. Um, you know, you can go on and on. Bob Davey, um, you know, didn't inherit, well, he inherited from, from, uh, from Lou Holtz and couldn't live up to it. So it does take a little bit of time. We don't want to hear that because we're, you know, we're part of the problem by saying that this team is loaded and they're a top five, seven team. And I, Still kind of believe that. I still think they're a top 10 team, but they're going to have to prove it against some, you know, some some competition coming up here. Let me just say that I think um, I think Louisville is going to be really difficult. Uh, they brought in another two dozen transfers. Jeff Brom's a good coach. They, they're off to a really good start. They're 2-0, scoring a lot of points. Who knows what Florida State's going to be by the time Notre Dame plays them, but it looks like they're going in the tank. I think Georgia Tech is dangerous, although their defense since that Florida State game has shown their true colors, which isn't uh, very good. I think Virginia's a little bit of a – could be a little bit of a surprise. At senior day, they lost a bunch of close games last year. They went with their younger quarterback, uh, but they've had defensive problems too. And then, you know, what USC is – Still remains to be seen, but Miller Moss, their quarterback, I think is going to be pretty good. So I don't, you know, we don't like to get ahead of ourselves too much. We want to cover the team on a daily basis. And in order to cover a team on a daily basis, all of our focus now is on Miami of Ohio and what they're capable of doing. I think Notre Dame should win that game, you know, fairly handily, but uh, we're not quite sure yet. 
Um, one thing on Miami of Ohio, their quarterback is super veteran, six-year guy. Um, Gabbert, Brett Gabbert, of course, the brother of Blaine Gabbert. So he's been around forever, but they are really struggling to score the ball, and they don't run it well. That's not typically a good recipe against this Notre Dame defense or what this Notre Dame defense has been the last few years. Um, you can bet Louisville will try to dial it up again. They felt very strongly last year. We, I talked to Chip Long on the field before the game last year, and they felt they had a coaching advantage in that game, and it bore itself out. Um, Notre Dame in that game will be playing its fifth consecutive contest. Louisville's already had a bye week and doesn't have a particularly challenging game this week. I think there's some difference to that. I think that um, for as much as we talk about Marcus Freeman losing some games, he absolutely should not have lost. I think it's worth noting that he's never opened a season at home as Notre Dame's head coach. Um, and not only that, he opened his first full season at a top two team in the country in Ohio State that was going on to play for a national championship. Um, few teams anywhere, especially in the power leagues, play more games away from home than Notre Dame. That's not making excuses because I was raised in SEC country and in SEC country, you don't like Notre Dame. But that's not making an excuse. That's the reality. Few, few teams anywhere, few coaches anywhere the last three years have coached more games away from home than Marcus Freeman. That's an obstacle he's never once complained about, but it is an obstacle. Um, it also helps when you're recruiting at a national level. But those are just a couple of factors that I think are important to, to keep in mind moving forward. Questions? Off of, sorry, what, what you were mentioning earlier about Coach Kelly being a really great CEO and maybe Coach Freeman being, um, you know, maybe a little bit more, I don't know, it's genuine or just more in tune with the team, but learning on the job, you know, I, I feel like one of the ways that, that the team kind of stayed mentally connected over the, the years while Coach Kelly was there, they actually had somebody in the role as like a mental performance coach that was working with the players, um, and I believe that person was let go when Coach Freeman took over. Um, have you heard anything more on kind of the inside perspective on whether they might be looking more into some of that sports performance, mental performance side of things with the team? Those people are in place. We you know, we don't hear, there isn't a lot of publicity about Joey Raymaker. Uh, John is, I think, the lead guy there. He's been there for quite a few years now. So, I mean, yeah, um, I think it might be, I think it might be a little more than that, but you can look that up. But no, I mean, I think that's being addressed. I don't think that that's an area that can be overlooked anymore. This is, this is the game that we play. Um, you need that. There's so many, there's so many assistants and, and, uh, you know, analysts and every, everything is addressed. I think they feel good about their strength and conditioning coach as well. Uh, he approaches things a little bit differently. I think maybe a little bit more of a modern day approach to things as opposed to, you know, offensive and deep, especially offensive linemen just being big and strong. They want them to be mobile. They lost a really mobile offensive lineman this past week in Ashton Craig. You don't usually see centers on the move. He's a guy that they could put on the move, put him in space. He got hurt on a play where he got rolled, where he went into space. Pat Coogan's going to replace him and he's not nearly as mobile, but, uh, you know, I mean, that, I, I think that system is in place. We don't have any reason to believe that that, uh, that portion of the program has been neglected. We just haven't heard maybe quite as much about the people that are involved with it. I would say, to your point, that's not the first time I've heard that question or, or heard that insinuated. I think there was a little bit of a gap in the 22 season because the, the players that returned did have this ironclad bond with uh, Selking, Amber Selking, I think, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, so there was an ironclad bond there, um, and they didn't specifically replace her because Raymaker was already there, and so there wasn't as natural flow. She wasn't um, as involved in Marcus's pro program, even initially before she wasn't retained. She was as involved because there was that, that transition. And it's tough when, when you take over for the guy that hired you and brought you there, and then you're told you're going to keep a bunch of people around you in the same process. That doesn't happen too often in the corporate world, to my understanding. And so that made it a little different. But I do think that Marcus has listened to parents, because I know parents from, from hearing from them themselves, expressed in that 22 season, they're, they weren't sure there was enough uh, sports psychology work being done or, or encouraged. And I do think that has improved in 23 and is continuing to improve in 24.
Yeah, yes. I, oh, sorry. And I think that we talked before the, the Texas A&M, Marcus Freeman talked a little bit about Joey Rainmaker and the impact he had on preparing for that environment, keeping your heart rate at a good level, you know, learning how either to uh, take deep breaths or meditate and find those moments to kind of still your heart rate and kind of keep even kill in those moments. So clearly they came out and did that. So I think he's definitely, that's one example of where he's probably having an impact. Yes, sir. Okay. Can you comment on the ACC where they're talking about allocating the income based upon ratings, et cetera, for their football program, et cetera? Would that be a possibility for Notre Dame to play Florida State, Miami, and Clemson every year? Because the ratings would go up and we would get some more revenue. I, I know that they were talking about this where the better the ratings, they would get a bigger percentage of the cut there. Can you yeah. I, I can talk a little bit about that. I've, I've talked to people about that uh, over the last several months, uh, especially when I was at the, the National Director of Football Ops meetings in May in Frisco, Texas. Um, quite frankly, what the ACC is doing is um, a complete Hail Mary to do anything in its power to keep Clemson and Florida State from leaving. Those two institutions already would have left if the SEC wanted them. The SEC does not want them. Now, it's been indicated if the Big Ten wanted any of those programs, it would be Miami. Um, they think for the media market and Miami being a private school and, and the overall academic profile, they like that fit much better from the Big Ten standpoint than they do Clemson or Florida State. They made it very clear they don't see Clemson or Florida State as academic fits for the Big Ten. The reason that wouldn't mean more money for Notre Dame, even if they played North Carolina, Clemson, Florida State, Miami, and some Georgia Tech or whomever every year is because Notre Dame already does not get a full share of the ACC revenue distribution because it's only a part-time member um, in football. What Notre Dame did do was just get a very lucrative new deal from Peacock and NBC that extends them out maybe through 29, maybe through 30. But I know from uh, talking with people that have had audiences with, with Pete Bavacqua, from hearing Pete Bavacqua speak recently, myself, um, he feels very good about where they are from a uh, revenue distribution standpoint with the deal that they got from Peacock and NBC, plus what they have gotten from uh, their ACC distribution. But their ACC distribution, I want to be clear, is significantly less than all other ACC teams because they only play those five games because they are very committed to their autonomy and their independence. John certainly knows more about this specific deal, but one thing I did see about the ACC, on somebody said it on Twitter, I forget who, um, was how, like he said, Florida State and Clemson, if they could have gone to these other two conferences, they probably would. But this new deal probably allows them to save face with their, you know, board or whoever it is. So now they can say, well, look, at least we did all this. We made this big deal about wanting to get out. This is what we got out of it. And as it pertains to Notre Dame, um, I think that kind of helps increase the stability. If the ACC doesn't fall apart, then it's a lot easier to be independent. So. The, the belief is, I'll just say this real quickly, the belief is we're shifting closer and closer to a 40 to 50 team super division of college football. And um, Mike Gundy went on the record just a couple of weeks ago, I wrote about this, saying he thinks it's inevitable that college football breaks off into its own entity. Those meetings that I got to sit in in, in May, and I didn't want to travel in May, like we were done with spring ball and I'm ready to play golf and leisurely travel and go to Major League Baseball games. Those are my hobbies, and I had to go. That that one is mandatory for my boss at football school. It's the best thing I've ever done. It's the best meetings I've ever done. I got to set in, the only media member to sit in with the SEC on their private DFO meetings in here. And, and this was what was really interesting to me in that. Those DFOs were stressing in May, hey, if you're an SEC team and you don't make the playoffs this year, the best bowl you can go to is the Citrus Bowl. Start preparing people now. There were people, DFOs, who don't even feel that heat, but they feel that heat. In May, we're already like being told, you better start conditioning your coach because if you're not an SEC playoff team, you can't go anywhere but Orlando, and that's considered a second-tier bowl for the SEC. Uh, so those are important to note. The realignment is not done um, in its current form. We'll know a little bit more when the House versus NCAA settlement is ratified. It took a setback earlier this month when the judge basically said the, the Players Union or the Players Association came out the night before and said, we accept this, we're good. 
Pete thought it was going to pass. They thought it could go into effect potentially January 1st of 25. If not, then July 1st of 25. The judge sent it back and said both you sides still have work to do. But I'll leave you with, with this on, on your point about where the, the sport's going in its future and what it means for significant programs. I'm really close friends with a, an assistant head coach in the ACC who's on a program that's won an ACC championship in the championship game area in the last decade. And he told me he is convinced – that the way things are moving, they won't have a seat at the table. Like he said, if it was soccer, we would get relegated. I don't see how we keep up. I wrote yesterday about um, the Arkansas Athletics Director, Hunter Juracek, spoke to the Little Rock Touchdown Club and said they're maybe at half of what their competitors are in the SEC. I'm told their SEC, that their NIL salary pool is between five and seven million. Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, Ole Miss, probably Texas A&M. They're 12 to 14 million, um, and that, that's where it is right now. Notre Dame, Notre Dame, Notre Dame's more than Arkansas. I promise you that. Um, it's not Tennessee or Ole Miss. There are currently 134 FBS teams, and there's no doubt there's it's going to be split in half, or maybe not even quite half. And I think it, you know, I mean, you look at if you're a group of five team, how do you? it's so difficult to keep your best players. It, 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 you know, the notion of just being able to go in and pick somebody, stick them in the lineup, he can, and he can play right away has really turned, uh, turned everything around here. So I don't think there's, I don't think there's any doubt that uh, there's going to be a split. And I think it's probably going to be sooner rather than later. And this is jumping back a couple of topics, but I really liked your question about Marcus and, and will they give him time? And and I should note, yeah, he inherited a program that had won 54 games, but also drove home this point earlier this week on, on the Insider Podcast. He's had a different starting quarterback every year. And in fact, Notre Dame is on its fifth consecutive season of a different starting quarterback. And it very obviously will automatically have a six different starting quarterback next year. That's not Marcus Freeman's fault. Absolutely not. Um, that's the people and the situation that he inherited where, where Notre Dame was not aggressive recruiting. Or if they got a recruit they liked, they just tried to take a program guy the next year. This, this crew does not pull crap like that. They are recruiting at the highest level. They're still fighting their butts off to try and keep Deuce Knight in the fold. They've got C.J. Carr, who I think we all believe is going to be incredibly elite. Um, they've got the 26 kid who's already committed. They're already on some 27 kids. Um, so that specific position approach, I think, you shows, shows you Marcus's impact holistically on the program because they take that approach everywhere. And they're, they're getting ready to play Saturday with 60% of the offensive line that they opened fall camp with not on the field. But because they've recruited really well, and I know Notre Dame is all on you, um, but they've taken it to another level. And they're elite with their evaluations. They're incredibly elite in the secondary, and we're seeing it more every week. But they're elite in a lot of places with their evaluations. And, and clearly the plan from here is to not go out and get another transfer quarterback next year. You like you got the player – the you know, you've got three other quarterbacks – that you like on the roster. Now, now, all three certainly are not going to stay this year. It's kind of miraculous that they have the four quarterbacks on the roster that they do. Uh, but so, you know, the plan is to pick from that group. I, there's One will be gone and two could possibly be gone. C.J. Carr is not going to leave. But so I, if you have to go with Carr or Minchie or whatever, Angeli, whatever, um, you won't be spending – seven figures on a quarterback next year and so you can allot that to a couple other areas where you know you need help it would have been nice to have another offensive tackle this year it would have been nice to have another defensive tackle or defensive end this year and so they'll uh, because of their their approach next year they will have that extra money to do so and in that win over a ranked sec team on the road to open the season no notre dame hasn't played a ranked sec team every year but, but that was notre dame's first win on the road against a ranked sec team in 20 years and i bring that up only because i wrote this the following week on football scoop for a story that i thought they would win and i've been working on it in advance of the game about the changes in the program 16 of the 22 offensive and defensive starters in that game were brought in by marcus freeman and company but it's he was just starting year three. When you add in the punter and the place kicker, it was 18 to 24. That again tells you they're evaluating well, they're finding the fits, and it's now um, much more his program than it ever has been before. Uh, how long jo has Joey Rimaker been at Notre Dame? Um, take the next question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which two freshmen? 
offense, defense, one on each. Do you see have the, has the highest upside? Bryce Young on defense, Kingston Villiamo also on defense. Micah Gilbert on offense. We talked about if you follow uh, Irish Illustrated, we talked about how they liked him in the red zone. We saw them throw a pass to him in the red zone. He didn't catch it, but he drew a, he drew an interference penalty against Purdue. Who else? Uh, I'm going uh, Gerby Lambert. Gerby Lambert. I think Gerby Lambert's, Gerby Lambert's future. going to be really, really good. First round draft pick. They're really high on Leonard Moore. They think I think Ben Morrison is a 25 first round draft pick. I think Christian Gray has a great chance to be a 26 first round draft pick. I don't think he'll last beyond the top 40 to 50 picks. And the way they talk and the little bit that we've seen so far of Leonard Moore, they believe he can be in that line. Now he's not as, Christian Gray is actually a little more physically gifted than Ben Morrison and a little longer. He's got really, really long arms and wingspan is incredible. Ben Morrison is technically sound at the position as anybody I've seen in a really, really long time. I'm I'm still interested to see how Anthony Knapp's career pans out. I think it'll be interesting after this year if he has to move back inside. You know, there's a lot of other tackles here that are going to get healthier, like Gerby Lambert coming up. So it'll be really interesting how that plays out. But I really like his length, his mentality. I mean, what he's kind of accomplished getting thrown in there this year. I think there's a really uh, a lot to like about his game. He's given up 10 pressures, I think, this far. Um, which is kind of a lot, but I think Riley Leonard's also run into a few of those, escaping the pocket rather than stepping up in it. So I think there's a lot to like about him. I'm just not quite sure where he's going to land in a, in a year or two along. The yeah, I, I think Anthony Knapp played his best game against the best player that he's gone against, and that was Nick Scorton, the transfer for Purdue that was at that's at Texas A&M. But, you know, I, and I think the running backs, Aeneas Williams and Kedron Young, those guys have looked good. We saw them in practice a little bit. They've looked good. They've they've done well in the game. But jumping back to the offensive line, you know they're not losing anybody at least in terms of eligibility after this year. So you, it's it's going to be a bottleneck. Charles Jagusa is not playing this year, and he was he was going to be the starting left tackle. Anthony Knapp probably moves inside. That's where they wanted him to play. Uh, Gerby Lambert's going to be really, really good. Sullivan Absher is a guy that they really like, but he can't get on the field. Ashton Craig just suffered the injury. He's going to play in the NFL. Billy Shrouth is going to play in the NFL, just suffered an injury. So I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen on that offensive line, but there will be no shortage of quality candidates to play those positions. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I want to get back to your offense. Um, Freeman, obviously, a defensive-minded coach. Um, made great hires in three years. Offensively, has, to me, has not made any good offensive hires. This is Don Brock's third stint at Notre Dame. He's kind of like a journeyman, although it's now. What gives you guys faith that Don Brock's actually a good coach? Well, I think it's a legitimate question. I mean, I don't, you know, I think a lot of people just acted like, oh, Mike Denbrock, LSU, number one, you know, a Heisman Trophy winner, number one offense, et cetera. So it was like it was a slam dunk. I will say in his defense, and I've known him for 22 years, um, he went out and proved it. He didn't. He did not get fired from Notre Dame. For, uh, he, like he wasn't fired that you have to go away. But Brian Kelly was going to take away his play calling duties in 2017, and Mike Denbrock said, "You know what? I'm not done growing as a play caller and a coordinator." So he went to Cincinnati, did great things with Cincinnati. Uh, and then, of course, went to LSU and, and, and uh, you know, played a role. I agree it's not a slam dunk, but I think Mike Denbrock is a much better offensive coordinator than he was when he was at Notre Dame previously. He warned us this was going to be a work in progress, and that wasn't an excuse. You start a, you start a season with six career, six career starts along the offensive line. Uh, you know, Riley Leonard, should Riley Leonard be better than he is at this stage? Probably, but he isn't an overly uh, experienced quarterback who was hurt last year and didn't play a whole lot. So, I, I mean, I understand where you're coming from. They're still developing the, uh, the wide receiver group. And I do think there are questions with Mike Denbrock. But I, I, I would just say let's give him a little bit more time. And I know there's no more time in this season. I get it. You can't, you can't make, you know, uh, you can't lose another game. Um, you know, I think Mike Brown is a, I mean, I think he's a pretty darn good uh, receivers coach. He developed a second, third, 
and fourth round draft pick for, at Cincinnati, which isn't easy to do with wide, wide receivers at Cincinnati. Uh, but Mike Denbrock has a lot more to prove. There's no doubt. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree that he has more to prove. I do think last weekend is an encouraging sign with that. I, I looked, Riley Leonard did, I think he was 0 for 3 on passes over 10 yards in that game specifically, and he still kind of orchestrated an offense, you know, more relying on Riley's running game that scored 66 points and put up, what is it, 278 rushing yards. We all, or, we all say, like everybody says, yeah. oh, oh, well, Purdue stinks. Well, we didn't think Purdue stunk that badly because the line went from 10 and a half to seven and a half. And I know that that had a lot to do with Leonard's Leonard's health. They did stink. Notre Dame beat the crap out of them. There's no doubt yeah. about that. Uh, and I don't think that they're, JB, say it. He said to me all week. They're not very well They're coached. Not very well coached. <laughs> you got to think that you got to remember Purdue had two weeks to play, pre prepare for that game, and in essence, Purdue had nine months to prepare for that game because they opened with Indiana State, and that was a trash performance. Um, on Denbrock, well, first of all, I would say I think Dylan McCullough is a freaking elite hire on the offensive side of the ball. How long they can keep him, I don't know, because I think he's a future head coach. Specifically, I think he's a future MAC head coach, probably starting out. Um, Denbrock, I got to know him maybe five years ago. I did a big feature on him for, for Football Scoop, and I was struck then by how much he wanted to continue to learn. And then uh, we broke the news at Football Scoop that he was leaving Cincinnati to, to go to LSU, and I watched him continue to adapt and learn there. Um, it's three weeks in, and you'd be frustrated about the offense, but you wouldn't maybe say this is a bad hire if they hadn't blown that game to Northern Illinois. But I understand the questions because um, even at Cincinnati, you know, he worked very intrinsically with Gino Gadouli, and they, they at times were, were almost co-play callers, I believe. Um, so I do think that, that Marcus has put together a, a solid staff in some spots. I think he's got probably from front to back the best defensive staff in the country. Um, we need to see more from Mike Denbrock, but I thought last Saturday was very encouraging. I've, I've said this. We saw more motion. We saw the little pop pass to Jaden Harrison a couple of different times. We saw Jaden Harrison, even though it was Angeli, targeted downfield. We saw Eli Raritan much more involved. I love telling this story. I was at dinner with Jason Garrett three years ago, um, and he was in town getting ready to do an NBC game, and we go to Cafe Navarre downtown, and he goes, who was number nine? I was like, Eli Rare, and he goes, that's the prettiest player on the field. He goes, that's your best player. Now, he got hurt, and we haven't seen it, but Jason Garrett had just gotten through coaching Jason Witten, arguably the best tight end in NFL history, and he said Eli Rare, and is that guy. So I'm hoping last week was the beginning of us seeing a whole lot more of Eli Rare, a whole lot more of the guys in space, and that's what they have to get to. The other thing is, though, that that's a, that's a talented but awfully green offensive line and and that's not Mike Denbrock's fault you know again and that's again that's not making excuses but just like Notre Dame has been in this freaking carousel of quarterbacks it had built for last year with Alton Fisher and then there wasn't a lot there with any experience and again those guys that are there are ones brought in by this staff so I'll open the room for passing <laughs> yeah. talk about the insertion of Faison because we haven't gotten much out of the field how important is it to get somebody who can produce? Yeah, he's just such a natural athlete. And he, he you know, they waited too long to play him last year. Um, and I think that may have contributed a little bit, at least to the changing of the, the, the wide receiver coach. But And then he goes out and helps the lacrosse team win a national title. He's just a natural. He's fearless. So, yeah, I do. You mentioned him before we, started, we got rolling here uh, about him. And I do think that he's... It's, it's very important that, that he's back on the field. They need to get Jaden Greathouse more involved. He's not quite as – he's not as sudden as, as Faison is, but he's got good size. He knows how to carve out space. Bo Collins has shown himself well. I think they, they need more out of Chris Mitchell. Uh, I'm not sure. He had some – he had drop – some drop issues in the preseason. He dropped a slant against A&M. Um, but yeah, they need, you know, it's not just all Riley Leonard and, and the, you know, we, we talked about it, his Leonard's propensity to escape laterally. And we talked to Den Brock about this yesterday, um, uh, as opposed to looking to step up because he's such a great running threat. Now he's such a great running threat that he can escape sideways backwards and still turn into a nine yard run. So it's kind of. He's kind of a victim of his own ability sometimes. But uh, they've got to get that receiving core going. I don't know that 
you know, we don't know if Leonard is going to be able to throw the ball down the field with any consistency. He did, he, he did it two years ago. Yeah. Uh, but he, but he has not, he has not recently. Yeah. And I think, uh, again, it, it all is intertwined. I'll tell you where I think they miss phase on the most is punt returner. Um, because when you talk to this staff going into the season, there was a firm belief that, that he would break it, that he would change the game as much as a punt returner, as a wide, re as he would as a wide receiver. And he might have quietly had the best camp of any wide receiver, which is why you heard more about him, which is why he was in position to, to start out there. But they really miss him, in my opinion, in, in punt return because they're not getting really anything there right now. And if you if you cheat and you still 15 yards on a punt return, and that's obviously more than a first down of real estate, but you're just changing everything your offense can do. The offense has to be with Riley Leonard right now, no matter how good Steve Angeli looks throwing the ball. And I thought Steve threw some brilliant balls and took some god-awful sacks this past weekend. But the line, it's not going to give you a pure pocket like a year ago. You don't have, you're do not you not flanked by Joe Alt and Blake Fisher with this super clean pocket and routes that are time to develop. Even with a lesser receiver core last year, they had routes that are time to develop. I'm going to turn it over to Drew right here because he's got the best stat about this. Oh, yeah, um, kind of in that vein. I think uh, both Wagner and Knapp have already given up more pressures this year than Alt gave up all of last year. And there are about four, so they, Wagner's given up six, Snap's given up 10, Alt gave up five last year, Fisher gave up 15 last year. So that means they're only four away from giving up more pressures than last year's tackles did all season. So they're pretty close to that. And I'll also add on Faison, you know, he moved from the slot to the field, but we were kind of curious. It's kind of seemed out of necessity, but clearly he kind of took hold of that position. And I think when he went out, against Texas A&M. He had two catches for 12 yards, but he had already played 20 snaps, I think. Um, and it was midway through the second quarter. And I think the leading receiver that game for snaps is like 48 for Bo Collins. So he clearly figured pretty yeah. significantly into their game plan at the field after only playing it for, you know, really a month, seriously. And Jaden Thomas is another guy that's in the equation there. We saw a little bit more of him. It's a much John, you mentioned it. It's not an SEC wide receiver group. It's much. It's clearly much better than it was in 2022 and 23. But there's still a ways to go. They've got a bunch of really nice two and three wide receivers. Some guys that'll have a chance to maybe go to the NFL and be three or four wide receivers. Now, Micah Gilbert might change that equation. We'll see if Cam can change that equation. He's not going to be a factor at all this year. But um, and then they've got to go out and recruit better um, because they're not recruiting well right now at wide receiver. Yes, sir. Okay, so last week's game reminded me a lot of the 2017 BC game. And in a podcast earlier this year, I know you all were comparing or fielded a question comparing Leonard this year to what Ian Book was in 2019, where he was passed first, but he had some happy feet and he kind of ran a lot. Do you think, given what we've seen now, does he comp out more similarly to like a Brandon Wimbush in 17-18? Or what do you see the offense potentially looking like if it's successful? I, I, the short answer is I hope not because Wim, Wimbush was was replaced when Chip Long Long went to Brian Kelly and said we've got to make a change. They were three and zero at that time. I, I I I think I would say maybe somewhere in between that, in between Book and and Wimbush. But Ian Book Ian Book is one of the most underrated quarterbacks in the history of Notre Dame. I I, I mean we can we can look back on it now and and see some of the struggles at, at, at the quarterback position. And I mean, he was a, he was a, he was a true run pass threat. Now he didn't see, he didn't see downfield real well because he wasn't really big and he had difficulty seeing over, over his offensive line. I'd like to think Leonard's a little bit more accurate than, than Wimbush or maybe a couple steps more accurate than Wimbush, but you guys, to go ahead and chime in. Yeah. Specifically oh. on in like 2019, not No, understandable. Yeah. yeah, no, I got you. I think the one encouraging thing about Leonard compared to Wimbush is I feel like Wimbush, I didn't cover the team that year, but I think I went to most of the games, is even the short, easy throws, he didn't look comfortable. He was missing them. And I don't have the numbers in front of me, but Leonard is still, for as bad as he is past 10 yards this season, he's still completing, what, 62 63% of his throws because he is pretty comfortable with those shorter passes. So I do think, at least from that perspective, he he doesn't have the kind of, I don't know if it was a mental issue or just mechanical breakdown that kind of limited Wimbush on even some of those easy throws. And, and we saw Riley throw the ball better than what we've seen in camp. Again, we saw parts of seven practices, one full one, um, and he did push it downfield better. And, and I've been really struck by him 
And again, maybe it, maybe it is because he was hurt, and even this past week it was in the back of his mind. Um, but I specifically watched him this this preseason camp. His footwork was so good, and they do these drills where you've got to you got to go between these foam dummies basically that are laying on the ground. And if you look down, they make you start the drill over. And Riley was so elite and so smooth running those drills up and down those barriers, never tripping on it and keeping his eyes downfield. And he's lost that in the game. And I'm surprised because it wasn't something that you saw him staying after practice to get extra work. Like, man, my footwork sucks. I got to fix this. No, his footwork, I noticed it then. He and CJ Carr had really, really good footwork in August, and we have not seen that. I suspect it's because as noble as he's been bragging on his offensive line, his body on some Sunday mornings has told him he's had the hell beat out of him. He did throw for 3,000 yards, you know, two years ago. But it also should be noted that in his career, both places, He's thrown uh, 25 touchdown passes and rushed for 24 touchdowns. So, I mean, that's just – that's who he is. He's – and I felt like this was the case, if I could kind of hear him, my big defensive Ian Book, but I felt like, you know, his running ability wasn't fully appreciated. It was looked at like, well, it would be better if he threw the touchdown pass instead of running for it. And, and I get where that's coming from. But offense is offense, and it, it, it all counts. But, you know, I mean, throwing the ball downfield is just not going to be um, an, an overall strength for him. But I, I think John's right. We did What we did see in the preseason was better and more accurate than what we've seen in games. But, you know, I mean, obviously games are a little bit more difficult. And devil's advocate, Ian Book, was an absolute, absolute gamer. But he played behind elite offensive lines pretty much every year and didn't take those shots downfield. Um, and I think he, he worried about his arm strength a little bit. You would see him. Now he did against Clemson, biggest biggest win. And I don't know. You, you people know better than me. I was there that 2020 game. He, he hits the shot to Avery Davis, or as some of my friends on campus that work with Jess call him Avery effing Davis. So <laughs> they were pretty fired up. But, um, yeah, Riley Leonard can push it downfield. He's got to get more comfortable. He's got to get healthier. Um, and they've got to call it more, and he's got to trust those guys more. He, they don't win at Texas A&M if he doesn't trust Bo Collins enough to throw that back shoulder 50-50 ball throw some more of those 50-50 balls. But right now, I think Bo might be the only guy he has the confidence in to catch him. And I, I mean, some slants to phase on. So, and, you know, I think that that can make a difference too. Okay. Yes, sir. Go ahead. How do you see that impacting the running game, I guess, as we go down, maybe against better coach teams, against teams that are able to stop the run better? I mean, they look good against Texas a and on a few runs, but there were, you know, outside of a few – Obviously, pretty big runs from price. Yeah, I mean, they. The it, to play no, no doubt. And it, it, I, it goes hand in hand. And they did their worst. Uh, uh, well, most of their running plays against Texas A&M were, were stuffs, as Tim O'Malley has, has named them. Um, I think 20. How many times they carry? Like 22 out of 34 or something were, were two yards or less were stuffs. So, yeah. And, I mean, there's no doubt that. The offense will bog down if you, over the course of time, in, in better defenses, Louisville, Louisville being one of them, uh, if you can't push the ball down the field, it's it's fortunately Jeremiah Love generally finds a way to extricate himself for a long run uh, every game and it's a long touchdown run. But um, and Jadarian Price as well, of course. But no, you're right. I mean, it's. It, it all counts and it all adds up and it all plays off of each other, uh, like two two voices in a in a rock band. Do they blend together or don't they? And uh, they're going to have to be, be they're going to have to be able to be much better. And it doesn't have to be thirty yard throws, right. but it does have to be twelve to yeah. fifteen to seventeen yard throws. Yeah, and I, that's why I was encouraged by the game plan last week. Even if they even if Riley wasn't successful downfield again. They got Eli Raritan more involved. They got Jaden Harrison. You did more stuff with more people that let you, and then you got back to running Riley Leonard. You have, Riley Leonard has to run to be an effective passer because running gives him bigger windows to throw into. He's got arm strength, but he does need a bigger window. We talked to Mike Denbrock yesterday, and he said he felt like um, the Purdue game was the first time that Mitchell Evans was okay. It's full go, and we saw we saw evidence of that. He, he was – 
he came back a little heavy. I don't know if, how much you have heard about yeah. that, John, but he came back a little bit heavy, which is now he had an ACL, so it's to, you know it's you're you're inclined to gain a little bit more weight, but at this level, when you're on the verge of being a, a high draft pick among tight ends, you got to take care of yourself a little bit better, even if you're coming off an injury. So he gained a little weight, but I but Mike Denbrock said. Uh, he said yesterday that uh, they think he's close to being, you know, where he needs to be. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, the scars from that Northern Illinois game still hurt. I know I was talking with my friend earlier, and uh, it, it, we're just starting to come out of that still, even after last week's win. So this event tonight was really needed. I really appreciate you guys being here. This almost feels like a support group. Maybe your name is Irish and Adam. We do. Instead of Irish and Adam. I try. Look, I, again, I've been doing this for more than four decades. That is exactly what we are many times. It's like, yeah, or, or uh, talk us off the ledge. Well, is it our job to talk you off the ledge? I've come to find that it is. <laughs> so I really appreciate ESQ, everyone having this today. So my question is, uh, just on recruiting with Deuce Knight, I know it's a battle. It's a battle. He's visiting Auburn in a week or next week. I forget. What exactly is happening right now as far as what type of communications do they keep up on? You know, we always hear about it, like, oh, they're staying in contact. Can you guys give us a little more in-depth of exact, exactly what their touch points are and how they're communicating? Yeah, I mean, Deuce is still calling them. It's not just a one-way street, or I think Notre Dame would um, take a, a harder line stance with him and say, you know, forget it. Like, we love you. We've been committed to you for a really long time. We thought you were committed to us. We're moving on. Um, I'll be honest with you, it helped Notre Dame that, that Auburn suffered a really disastrous loss last weekend against Cal. The communication is two ways. The communication continues to be Notre Dame is a 40-year decision. You're going to make really nice NIL money. And he would be probably another seven-figure NIL quarterback at Notre Dame, like, like the the one now and the one last year. Um, so it's not that much different. Now, Auburn's maybe offering like $2 million right now. That's different. Um, Auburn offers a complete runway where you start from day one almost certainly, and it's your, your world to roll. I think that's – and then he's got some familial pressure that would rather him say we can – we can drive three hours, four hours, and, and watch you play every week. Or some of your games might be even closer than that because it's the SEC. And then, look, it, it's the SEC. It's, um, you know, um, it's the conference right now. It's the highest profile conference, and it's the conference that puts the most draft picks in the NFL every year. I saw uh, Alabama released a graphic last week for the onset of the start of the NFL season. They showed some of their guys. And I don't even think it was all of their current NFL guys. But the, the thesis of the graphic was the guys pictured had over a billion in NFL contracts. On the, a, a billion. That was insane. That's a, uh, that's a line. Yeah. Of the NFL, the Irish guys. Yeah, exactly. And then Notre Dame has done that. Notre Dame has been very cognizant to say these offensive linemen have $500 million in deals out there or, or whatever it is. So the, the communication, I'll, I'll tell you this, Deuce Knight has never called and said, I'm decommitted. I'm no longer coming here. Now, I think he's also very strongly indicated to Auburn, hey, I'm committed. So whether he'll say that publicly, that's we'll find out. But Notre Dame um, knows it's in, a, it's in a hell of a puncher's fight right now, but their feet aren't as wobbly as they were three weeks ago. And Notre Dame can't. Excuse me, Drew. Notre Dame can't guarantee him a, a starting spot like Auburn can, and I, I don't think there's any doubt that Deuce Knight. You know, when when Riley Leonard gathered some players down in Alabama, Deuce Knight saw C.J. Carr, and I think that he's very, very conscious of the fact that C.J. Carr could just step right into the starting lineup next year, and and Deuce Knight wouldn't see, you know, wouldn't see the light of day. I will say now, in talking to people on campus. If, if Deuce stuck with his commitment and, and followed through and it was uh, C.J. Carr that won the starting job, they're confident enough in his abilities and his talents that they would still want to have a Deuce Knight package next year. I do know that um, as long as he could handle it. But they have that much belief in his skill set that even if it's C.J. Carr, your starter, they, they believe they could have a Deuce Knight package. And they've, they've communicated that to him as well. Yeah, and I, I think it's encouraging that he's still committed, at least publicly, because I'm at this point, if you would have asked me a month and a half ago if he would still be committed to Notre Dame, I would have said, of course not. Like, I did not expect us to be this far. So that's got to be an encouraging sign. And I think there's probably things that can tell him, even if he can't play right away, I think he is somebody that needs some development as a passer that would probably be better served 
at a place where he doesn't have to play right away and potentially like fail. Kansas. Yeah, so he can maybe. <laughs> John, yeah. are you hearing if uh, Mississippi is ever going to the next one down? I would, I would be very surprised um, because that's that i mean they'll do it from from a surface level standpoint and they'll they'll make splashes about it they'll want the attention of it i just don't know how earnest it is i've known lane for about 15 years since he was at tennessee um and we got to know each other then and we've stayed in sporadic contact through the years um that typically has not been the model of quarterback that he's wanted to utilize for his offenses um, the other thing I think, uh, and I've said, and I really firmly believe this, is that Lane Kiffin will be on the short list of candidates at Florida whenever that happens. Um, and he stayed at, at Ole Miss because of his daughter when he could have had Auburn two years ago. But she's a lot closer to graduating now. And um, Ole Miss is doing some really nice things. And they've um, bought one of the best rosters in all of college football. But they haven't. Can they sustain it? And they're still not quite. They've sold out some games, but but even last year, they're in a historic run under Lane, and they still had some games that didn't sell out, and they only seat about 65,000 there at Vaught-Hemingway Stadium. So I think Auburn is a bigger threat. Anything can change because Ole Miss has spent as lavishly as anybody, including Tennessee and Ohio State and Texas A&M. And I like Lane now. He's, he calls an offensive game that is so fun to watch, but that has not been the type of quarterback that he's geared himself around. Dan Ernst. This one's for JB. Uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow said that music is the universal language of mankind. Yeah. I know how big of a music guy you are. As a member of the Dave Matthews Warehouse, yes. <laughs> this team currently, as it sits today, was either a Dave Matthews song or short lyric. How would you best describe this team? <laughs> that's, completely, that's completely unfair. Somebody, um, somebody finally stopped JB. You know what? And Tim, and Tim is a Beatles fan, if you want to go first. Until, um, you know, right now, no, because they lost that damn Northern Illinois game, I'll say they're under the table and dreaming. Under the table and dreaming. Uh, you know, they could be ants marching the rest of the season. <laughs> I am an irrational Dave Matthews fan. Uh, tough to follow up that one, but uh, Patello's injury last week sucked just because he's a guy who's been through the ringer and – really matured and he could have given up in Notre Dame, but he stuck around. How do you see the, obviously, Traore's an ascending player who looks like he has all the talent in the world, but who's taking second team reps? I mean, two of them, Tim, he's been very clear that he's got mm -hmm. some limitations. Can Logan Thomas ascend to that second spot, or is he too slight right now? I mean, he had some weight issues. I mean, I, I think that they can – they've really been happy with what Logan Thomas has shown, and he was coming off of – was it a shoulder in the spring? Uh, so we didn't really get a, a chance to see him at all. But the, they really like him as a pass rusher. Now, anything other than certain passing downs, you know, I don't know about that. Uh, just uh, briefly about Batella. Batella had come so far and was playing so well, and it was such a great tag team with Traore. And you could feel it didn't matter who was in. You felt good about them rushing the passer. Uh, I mentioned, I said something to uh, Al Golden about <clears> – <throat> Uh, Bryce Young. Bryce Young's a bigger, longer body, more conducive for the the defensive end side, the strong side end side. He did, he didn't seem to indicate that he might fl flip him over there, but I still think that that could be a possibility, just because I mean Bryce Young, and the, and he covers. We've seen him. I saw him at the Army All American game drop into coverage, um, and and I don't know how much that was scheme versus that was instinct because I've cover, covered several of those games through the years and, and it's a pretty basic game plan. So his his football IQ is pretty innate. They've got to get Josh Burnham healthy just to give them more rotation at either end, however they decide to mix and match it. Um, Botello, you're right, you hate it especially. I, I don't know that they've showed any clips of it on the Peacock series yet, but I've been told by enough people – his why when he addressed all the seniors before the season addressed the team and they had to tell like their why, they said his why was unbelievable. Yeah, I think going back to Traor, I think there's a lot of reason to have confidence in him. Even what, going back to like fall camp, I remember thinking like this guy can't not jump off sides. Like he just kept going and going and, and 
by the end of fall camp, you saw him kind of get rid of those. I think he had a fall, uh, jumped off sides early in the Texas A&M game, but I'm not sure we've had another one since. And even yesterday, Al Golden was talking about how much more assignment correct he is and how much he's improved even in those two months. So I think as he mentioned, he loves practicing, or Marcus Freeman did. Right. And as we've seen more and more of that, I think we've seen now, him Marcus really Marcus Freeman flourish. mentioned that, that uh, Kennedy Erlacher, who looks so good on Saturday, hasn't quite learned how to how to pr uh, practice yet, but I'm uh, I, we're going to take one more question. JB wants to uh, jump in here. Anytime I have an opportunity to talk about Bryant Young, the father of, of Bryce Young, I do because I, I covered I covered BY back in the day, and I mean I can remember just the way that people, his teammates, looked at him and talked about him. The respect for Bryant Young was off the chart, and I have no doubt that Bryce Young is cut from the same cloth. BY is, I've been doing this 43 years, and if you ask me, name five players and during that time that you respect more than any other, Bryant Young would be right in the middle of that. What a great, great Notre Dame guy he is. Uh, no, no, uh, no uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I'll just jump in real quickly to the Kennedy Urlacher point. I asked Marty Biaggi specifically yesterday, okay, has he extrapolated it to the practice field, especially after you get those kind of reps in a game, it can be more easier to show the buy-in. And uh, he cracked a joke and he said he absolutely has. As a matter of fact, he showered before meetings this morning to make sure he was fully awake <laughs> and got everything out of it that he could. So that was interesting. I would also wonder if maybe um, the open date, week if they if kva is so talented so instinctive i wonder if they might give him a look there behind Treori if they're still trying to figure out the pieces and mix and match a little bit because they want that guy on the field as much as possible and that that has been a big part of, of kva's preparation is coming off the edge so that would make that would certainly would make sense yep one more question we said no more he wants to cut off. I like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Gabe Rubio, when do we expect him back? Probably after the bye week. Yeah, there was some hope and belief that he could be ready for Louisville, but I watched him exit yesterday and he was not a practice participant it's hard to think if he didn't participate in practice yesterday that he could even get 12 snaps against louisville i asked jason Oni about him yesterday and he's like he'll be back so soon so i didn't give any specifics but he seemed i was like what's it like having him out you know they're pretty good friends and he was like i'm not even worried about that he's about to be back any day now so who knows but he seemed pretty he didn't even want to ask like oh i miss playing with him he was like i'm ready to play with him again so and, and with regard to billy shrouth um you know, you've got the Miami of Ohio game. You got Louisville. I got to keep these straight, right? You got Louisville, then you have a bye week, and so they're they are hoping that maybe Louisville, but I, I just think that that's very doubtful. No, I think best case scenario for Billy Shroud is Stanford, the high ankle sprain. I don't see. Did you? Have, we'll take one more if you had it. Yeah, it's a historical question, so maybe for Tim. Uh, no, I, 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 well, <laughs> when you, when you said historical, I thought of the late, great Lou Samoji who worked. God, you got a leather helmet around We were, we worked. I mean, some of you guys know who Lou Samoji was and is, and, um, he, he was way better at the historical stuff. I turned that over to him. So I may need a little help on this one. Yeah. I, I follow Notre Dame football closely since the mid eighties, but racking my head on what year we played two quarterbacks with regularity successfully. Like as a plan, not not something by necessity. Correct. Is anything popping in your head? Could have been an eighty seven before he got hurt? Rice and Andresiak, yeah. yeah, I think that's uh yeah. I mean I think Holtz wanted to I just talked to Tony Rice last week, as a matter of fact. I hadn't talked to him in a while, and I, I hope to see him uh, next Friday before the Louisville game. Some Notre Dame guys are coming in. Yeah, they tried that a little bit. They probably, you know, Tony, man, you want to talk. You, people, are, people are talking about Riley Leonard having throwing problems. Tony, <laughs> Tony. But what a great, I mean, what a great quarterback and competitor and, and leader uh, and, and, and all that. But, yeah, they, they played a little bit of that, but I think it was uh, – you know, they wanted to give Andreziak that first shot uh, back then. starting and Reese closing? Yeah, yeah, no, no doubt. And, and, and again, 
when you talk about Brian Kelly, would he have gone to Steve Angeli in the second half? He wasn't afraid to. He knew that he wanted Golson as a starter, but do I trust him when the game's on the line? Let's go to the guy that's a little bit steadier. So, um, Chris, any thoughts? I would just want to say truly, I'm humbled. Like. I love Chicago, but it's not the easiest place to navigate downtown. To, to have this many people here is, is pretty dope. I mean, we left, Mintock and I left South Bend at like uh, 1 o'clock to make sure we had, 1 o'clock Eastern to make sure we had plenty of time. And I did want to sneak and, and get a birthday gift for my wife, so I accomplished that. But to have this turnout is humbling. To have Ga host us here at ESQ is next level. And for Dan and, and Noah putting it together, and the, the really intelligent questions, I'm, I'm grateful because we get to do some stuff like this. And um, it reminds us that our jobs don't suck. So thank you. Yeah, I just, again, I want to reiterate, thank you all for coming. This has been really cool. I know you're mostly here to see this guy oh, talk, cover it 43 years. And John's of expertise, but I appreciate the opportunity as well. It's a lot of fun. I, whenever I'm asked a question like that, I, I, I take the opportunity to <clears throat> Talk about having grown up in South Bend and what, a, what an amazing school and football program and everything that goes with the University of Notre Dame. And I, and I don't – somebody asked me where was I. It was a recent gathering like this. And uh, it was, a, it was a, actually a local club. And uh, will Notre Dame ever get up to the level that Georgia is and Ohio State is? And I'm like, you know, probably not in my lifetime. I, I don't know how much longer I've got, but – you know, it's just, it's going to be really, really difficult, but I'm so proud of my alma mater and what it stands for, and that still means something, and I understand in 2024, it's all about winning and winning the national title. I guess it's always kind of been like that, but it's even ramped up on steroids now, but I am so proud of my alma mater and what it represents, and uh, no, not always the best team in the country on the football field, but the combination of what it stands for academically, uh, spiritually, and all that, I am, I am honored. I have lived, I've lived the, the dream of a lifetime being able to do what I do, and it's because I'm so proud of Notre Dame.